title of the series, uh, Building. And I think when it, when it was emailed to me, it was Rebuilding. And I thought, wow, that's interesting, Rebuilding. But it evolved into Building. But it, that doesn't really matter. But what is Building a Sustainable Society? And I thought that was a very interesting topic. And that's what kind of started uh, my thought process going. So one of the key buzzwords, and you can't be in government without having buzzwords, so one of the key buzzwords that we have right now is resilience. And I think it ties in very well with um, the sustainable uh, society piece, because resilience is the ability of um, a community, uh, an entity, to anticipate uh, rebound from and get back to a normal, a normal state. And with that always comes change. And the change that we're all talking about in this sense is all of the uh, incidents that happen, whether they're man-made or uh, nature-driven, that cause disasters to disrupt our daily events. So this is one of probably a million definitions that you'll find on resilience. Uh, they all essentially say the same thing, but it's the ability to absorb the impact of the change and then bounce back quickly and get to an, an, another normal state. And I throw that into, what does that mean for a community, a community like Thomas? So I decided to figure out what the definition of a community would be. And of course it is geographic, but it's really more than that. It's anything that drives groups of people together. So it can be um, the law enforcement uh, has their own community, perhaps the school teachers have their community. Uh, it could be a, uh, a tea group that has their own commu uh, community. Uh, they all get together, they interact, and they form a cohesive group. So when you think of community, think uh, beyond Taos and think about maybe your, your next door neighbors, uh, your neighborhood watch program, that type of thing. So the next iteration of that then is what is community resilience? How does a community, whether it be Taos or those uh, sub-entities, actually become resilient? And I think that's really what the crux of this uh, briefing is all about. So we want to have the community do those necessary things where they can absorb the impact, respond to it, recover from it, and get back to a normal state again as soon as possible. And a lot of times when we talk about this getting back to a normal state, uh, you'll often find people that will say, well, there's, there's always going to be a new normal. Um, and I think in a lot of ways that's probably true, but that doesn't necessarily mean it has to be bad or less than. I think you have a choice, and I think the work you put into being prepared ahead of time determines what the outcome is of the new normal at the end of the event. So, um, that's really what it's all about. So the, I think this last uh, quote, and again, everything that you'll see on the slides, I, I stole from the internet. And I'm, I think I've learned to be a good emergency manager because I think that's what they all do is steal as much as they can. But um, so I thought this quote was also very good. Uh, that you harness those local resources and the expertise to help yourselves during that emergency that complements the folks from law enforcement, the firefighters, and all of those uh, folks that will come in eventually to provide assistance. So now I'm getting back to, well, what's a sustainable society and why is resilience different than sustainable? So what I've discovered is, well, it's really just time frame. Resilience is that short term, how quickly can we get back on track? Sustainability is that longer term, how do we use those resources over a long period of time to make sure that we've got um, that new normal that we can, uh, can go 
on in time. Uh, so the, the rest of the slides are, uh, most of the rest of the slides are what I told you, I just pulled things off the internet that I thought might be good launching points for discussion. And this in no way is uh, designed to be an all-inclusive uh, view of the hazards that we face, but I think um, they're very representative and there's certainly far more. Uh, this particular slide, uh, I was actually looking for um, some photos from some of the fires in New Mexico. This one just happens to be in Colorado, but I, I it was just drawn to it because it was something that I saw uh, not too long ago down south in uh, one of the fires down there. But fire is one of those things um, that you have to be ready for. Uh, and much like the hurricanes that are occurring now, uh, you'll have folks that say, well, you know, I can ride this out. Well, some of the fires that come across here, due to the, the very dry weather that we've had for so long, and the intense heat, and just the extreme low humidity, uh, the fires have been very intense. Uh, this year, uh, we've had fewer fires uh, than we did last year, and fewer acres burned. Uh, but, you know, those statistics don't always tell a story. Um, you know, Rio Doso will tell you that was a devastating fire because it impacted so many homes and businesses. The Wildwater Bali fire was um, incredible just due to the number of acres that were destroyed. And then you deal with the impact of the Dyscar area, which I'm sure you're all very familiar with. So the other thing about uh, this photo that kind of comes to my mind is the issue of the drought. And that has many implications. Uh, it affects uh, the water supply, it affects our agriculture, it affects recreation. So many things are impacted by the drought um, that cause a disruption in our normal lives. And, uh, I'm going to read off some of the things that I've uh, pulled off. A lot of this is national. It doesn't specifically relate to New Mexico, but um, you, can, you can pick what you like and, and uh, interpolate it. But, um, it says, by 2050, as much as 42% of the world's population um, may live in countries with insufficient freshwater supply. When I was in uh, active duty, we often studied about uh, water and the shortage of water being the actual um, uh, impetus for the next world war. And I believe with uh, the way some of the natural weather patterns are occurring, uh, that's certainly a plausible uh, scenario. So what, what we in the United States might face is maybe not uh, that lack of water supply, but we'll be dealing with those immigrants who are getting away from where they are that it has a, a very significant water supply issue, and now that burden will, will fall on us. Another issue I think that uh, is caused by drought is, <clears throat> or facilitates the drought, is we have population uh, distributions that are changing over time. We have people living in deserts. I think of Las Vegas, <laughs> where they, they pump in all their water there. Um, you know, what is it that drives us to live in places that don't naturally have water? And how, how do you expect to survive that? So some things we bring on ourselves that we have to live with that. Um, this last year, the Mississippi River was actually very low, and that's a very major transportation node. Uh, but it just shows the level of uh, drought that's occurring. Ranchers have to wa haul water for cattle because their ponds are dried out. Um, one, one photo I really wanted to put up here was a photo from uh, near Abilene, Texas, where I spent a number of years. But you can see a lake, a huge lake, uh, that is just dried up. And uh, it's just amazing to see. So this year, 71% of the country was classified as abnormally dry or worse, and that was
was two times worse than June of last year. New Mexico is in a uh, period of years of extreme or severe drought. And uh, I get slides every day that kind of gives updates on issues across uh, the United States and all different areas. And I continually watch the drought uh, picture because it, it changes based on the monsoons and folks getting rain, but all the precipitation we're getting doesn't come close to filling up the aquifers and uh, getting our supply back where it needs to be. The current drought has forced the disaster declaration in 26 states, and uh, there is a uh, federal assistance now that is available to all 26 states, which New Mexico is one of. This is the picture that uh, depicts the illegal immigration. Of course, we are a, a border state, and we have a lot of uh, assets that are focused in that area. <clears throat> there are a number of issues with that. Um, most of the, the difficult ones are the illegal drugs that are coming in, um, some of the transportation of people, you know, families will bring in their kids, they'll leave their kids here, they'll go back, uh, all to get their citizenship. A lot of different issues involved with that. And the other thing that, uh, uh, from my perspective, that I start thinking about is, although New Mexico doesn't have the immigration problem that our, our neighboring states do, uh, we have a significant challenge in that these individuals that do the illegal immigration drug smuggling, they're very good. We have a lot of assets. I actually spent uh, some time on the border, and if you drive uh, along the southern New Mexico border area, you are, you are actually surprised to see somebody who lives there because most of them are border patrol agents. You'll be driving and you'll pass uh, eight or ten of them before you actually see a rancher or somebody who lives down in that area. But one of my big concerns is there are a lot of national, international entities out there that um, are trying to smuggle uh, things in. There's a pretty good network uh, from Mexico that is very good at this, and we don't know how much we actually catch or don't catch. But uh, some of the, the estimates from the professionals are, are really not good. Uh, you know, we expect we catch maybe 25%. But that's just an educated guess and we don't really know. So if, uh, say, Al-Qaeda or a terrorist organization actually starts teaming up with a drug cartel or some of these other entities in Mexico, what, what would that do? And what kind of threat does that actually cause uh, for the United States? So those are some of the things that um, causes me to, to pause. Other, um, other groups that kind of fall in this category, there's home, homegrown violent extremists. Um, they range anywhere from just individuals who are disenfranchised or maybe mentally ill. Um, you know, and we've had plenty of uh, shootings uh, very, in various places around the country that demonstrate that very well. But there are also groups that fall into that category as well. No, thank you.